Hey guys, Greg Knuckles here with stringtheory.com, and today we're talking about skeletal muscle hyperplasia. So what is hyperplasia and why does it matter? Okay, so there are basically two ways that your muscles can get bigger. There's hypertrophy, which is the muscle fibers themselves getting larger, and there's hyperplasia, which is getting new muscle fibers. And so just know from the outset that hyperplasia is still a somewhat contentious topic uh, about whether or not it occurs in humans. Consensus seems to be moving in the direction that it does occur in humans to um, a significant degree, but there are still some people who don't believe it occurs in humans, and there really isn't any debate about the fact that hypertrophy is the primary way muscles get bigger. Um, but there is, there is, in my opinion, compelling evidence that hyperplasia does occur in humans to a relevant degree. And so basically this video uh, goes through the evidence supporting that view, and um, then at the end I'll discuss how relevant that is to your training. Okay, so first things first. The majority of the studies to this point done on skeletal muscle hyperplasia have used what's called the avian stretch model. So that involves birds, and uh, how these studies are set up is they hang a weight from the bird's wing, and that stretches the muscle on the, the muscles on the back side of the wing, and under that consistent stretch for a couple weeks, couple months, the muscles get way, way, way bigger. Um, so if memory serves the largest degree of muscle growth ever seen in a scientific study was utilizing this avian stretch model, it was by Jose Antonio, the current head of the International Society of Sports Nutrition, during his grad school days, if memory serves. And it saw just absolutely absurd degrees of muscle growth, something like 90% enlargement over uh, pre-stretch values. And that included, uh, again, something like 35 to 40% of that was accounted for by hyperplasia, getting more muscle fibers. Um, and so it's not, there's not really a question about whether hyperplasia can occur. It's just uh, a question of whether it occurs in humans because it's pretty undeniable uh, in the avian stretch models that hyperplasia did occur to a very, very great degree. But again, that research isn't super relevant to humans or normal training purposes because you're probably not going to be putting a muscle on stretch for weeks at a time. As an aside, I kind of want someone to do this. They used something like 10 to 20% of the bird's body weight for the weights they were hanging off of the wings for most of these studies. What I would really like someone to do is um, just get like 20 pound wrist weights and hang them from your wrists and just leave them on for a month or two and just see if your traps get enormous. Um, people would probably give you funny looks, but if you wind up with ginormous traps at the end of it, I figure it's worth it. Uh, so if someone wants to try that, let me know and keep me posted. Um, okay, anyway, getting back to our normally scheduled program. So uh, moving on to other animal research. Uh, hyperplasia has also been observed in both mice and cats uh, using protocols that are much more relevant to our purposes here. So basically they would rig them up to apparatuses that would mimic weight training type movements and have them do pretty normal type protocols. So the type of stuff that you or I would probably be doing in the gym. And they observed both muscle hypertrophy and hyperplasia in those studies as well. Not to nearly the same degree as the avian stretch model, but also to a significant degree. So um, there, there's very, very robust direct evidence in animal models that hyperplasia can occur. Moving on to humans though, uh, all of the evidence we have thus far and probably will ever have is indirect evidence. And there's a good reason for that. Two good reasons for that actually. One is that you either have to kill your subjects or cut a muscle entirely off of their body um, to, to examine hyperplasia. There's, there's not any type of like scanner that you can put up to a muscle that's going to measure uh, how many fibers are in it. So uh, the, way, the way you have to account for hyperplasia is basically 
taking a muscle completely off, cutting it in half, and just counting the muscle fibers. So um, ethics boards are, are pretty uneasy with killing human subjects for the purposes of research, uh, you know, Nuremberg Code, stuff like that. Um, and also, it would just be absurdly tedious to do this type of research on humans because you have to count each individual muscle fiber manually. So in, say, like a rat's muscle or a cat's muscle, they have, they're smaller than us. They have much smaller muscles than we do. So it's a large task to count every fiber in the muscle of a mouse or a cat, but it's not nearly as tedious as counting uh, every fiber in the muscle of a human. So uh, just as kind of a point of reference, the human biceps have something like half a million muscle fibers. So um, I don't think you're going to find too many people who would volunteer to count half a million muscle fibers in one muscle, let alone, you know, you're going to have multiple subjects. So counting to half a million, yeah, 40, 50, 60 times, you're not, that's just simply unfeasible. So it's unethical and it's pretty much outside the bounds of what you're going to be able to get someone to do to directly verify uh, muscle hyperplasia in humans. So the best thing we have is indirect evidence. And it comes from two, two primary sources. One is in comparing um, muscle fiber size to whole muscle size in bodybuilders versus untrained or recreationally trained controls. And so basically, if, if a bodybuilder has 40% more cross-sectional area in an entire muscle, uh, you would expect them to have roughly 40% more cross-sectional area in each muscle fiber because muscle fibers take up the vast majority of space in the muscle. You know, there's some blood vessels, there's some nerves, there's some connective tissue, but a muscle is mostly just muscle fibers. So, um, but what they found, not in every study, but in a lot of them, is there's a discrepancy between um, how large the bodybuilder's muscles were relative to controls and how large each individual fiber was relative to controls. So uh, just just using some random numbers, if the bodybuilder's muscles were 40% larger, um, each muscle fiber may only be 20-30% larger, which you could you could draw two conclusions from that. One, or both conclusions. One would be that they just simply started with more muscle fibers than the, than the controls did, which, you know, that, that kind of makes sense on the surface because they're getting super jacked. So it's not, it's not out of the question to assume that they just had more muscle fibers to begin with. Or number two, that through training, hyperplasia occurred and they gained more muscle fibers. And so again, this is indirect evidence because with those types of study designs, you can't establish which one it was or to what degree those two things were taking place. Um, but better indirect evidence comes from looking at contralateral limbs of cadavers. So in one study, uh, right-handed people, their left tibialis anterior, which is uh, the muscle on the front of your shin, so sitting right next to your tibia in front, so tibialis anterior. Uh, Right-handed people, their left tibialis anterior had about 11% more muscle fibers than their right tibialis anterior did. And the conclusion that the authors of that study drew um, was that just from the frequent low-level demands of just standing up, walking around, etc. over the course of a lifetime, um, those repeated asymmetrical demands just, just basically caused uh, hyperplasia in the left tibialis anterior because with that consistent of a pattern um, there's really no reason to assume that those righties were all just just all happened to be born with more muscle fibers in their left tibialis anterior so uh, that was probably just a result of you know being a right-handed asymmetrical person so um, there's direct evidence in animal models including uh, cats and mice that were doing training protocols pretty similar to what you might be doing in the gym. And there is indirect evidence in humans. Some of it is weak, looking, comparing uh, 
bodybuilders muscle fibers to uh, untrained or moderately trained controls and also stronger indirect evidence um, comparing muscles on different sides of the body okay so the next question is how this happens there are two main theories one is that the satellite cells around your muscle fibers can actually just fuse together uh, and form new muscle fibers themselves. Um, I believe there's in vitro uh, research indicating that that can happen, and it makes sense that it could happen because those satellite cells are what become the myonuclei that uh, oversee the ongoings inside the muscle fibers anyway, so they have they have the potential to do that. And the other one, which there's much more robust evidence for, is fiber splitting. So, uh, you know, you have a muscle fiber that's just running straight up and down, and when it gets damaged and those satellite cells come in to repair it, sometimes that doesn't happen perfectly, and it doesn't fuse all together and maintain just one fiber running straight, the fiber will split, so it'll be coming this way and then branch off in two different directions. And there's really, really good evidence for fiber splitting. It's seen in a lot of studies on almost every uh, highly strength trained cohort. Um, well, I wouldn't say almost every, but a lot of them. It's, it's not an uncommon finding at all. So, so those are the two main ways that hyperplasia could occur, and there's really good evidence that fiber splitting does occur in a lot of people. Okay, so the last question is, how relevant is this to us? How much is this going to affect how we actually train? And the answer is probably not all that much. Uh, it's hard to establish just how much skeletal muscle hyperplasia accounts for total muscle growth in humans. So uh, we know that just the asymmetrical demands, low-level day-to-day life type demands, uh, can lead to there being 11% more muscle fibers in one tibialis anterior than the other, but uh, you can't necessarily generalize that to strength training. So it could be that because those demands are so frequent, that um, that 11% hyperplasia would be way more than you'd expect to see in strength training. Or it could be because the magnitude of the stressor from strength training is a lot, well, it's just much higher magnitude of stressor. So if uh, most of those new fibers are coming from something like fiber splitting, you may expect it to actually play a bigger role in strength training. And the fact is we just don't know how big of a role it plays, but, um, from what we can tell thus far, it seems like you don't really actually have to go out of your way to try to cause hyperplasia to make it happen. So uh, like I said, with those mice studies and with those rat studies, um, they saw hyperplasia doing, again, just basically like normal type training, not doing anything crazy like the avian stretch model. And like I said, in a lot of strength trained cohorts, they see split fibers uh, without people necessarily going out of their way to cause uh, hyperplasia. So really, there's not too much you can do with this information. It shouldn't necessarily change the way you train in any meaningful way. But since this is string theory, this is a channel about how you get big and strong. So, you know, knowing how your body actually goes about getting big and strong, understanding the nuts and bolts of it a bit better, is never a bad thing. So, uh, like I said, not necessarily a prescriptive video, just general information. So, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully you don't feel like you wasted your time. Hopefully you feel like you're just a little bit smarter for having watched this. A lot of resources will be linked in the description if you want to read about this in more detail. And uh, so if you liked the video, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. And I will see you in the next video. All right.